I like that clip for a lot of reasons because it shows us in uh, in architecture in 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 a certain form of Western architecture as well. This idea that you ask brick, what should you be? Brick talks back to you and says says what it will be, and you have to honor the materials. I also like looking at people who are so into being in class, maybe because you could smoke in class. So at least as my dad describes it, he'd come into these classes and everybody was smoking. And so you'd be sitting around and the professor was be full ashtrays all over the place. Anyway. <laughs> oh, I know why I like it too. This uh, Louis Kahn uh, was also the designer. I later found out of uh, the library where uh, I went to high school in New Hampshire. So there are some people who just come to this campus and take a picture of the. That's the inside of the library. They just come there and take a picture and then walk off because they've they've seen it all. It was also the first library that I heard. Have you ever heard? the old story about when they designed this library, they didn't calculate the weight of the books. And so it's now slowly sinking into the ground. You ever heard that? <laughs> People say that about many libraries. <laughs> it's kind of like a joke. It's like a genre. It's like that some architect has forgotten the weight of the books. I've heard that about at least three different libraries in my time. I guess these days it doesn't matter. Nobody has any books anymore. Don't have to calculate the weight. In any case, in these days and other days and other times, all over the place, people do ask the natural materials. They ask the materials themselves what, what needs to emerge. All right, so far so good. Let's talk about the contrast between these paradigms. And as Ingold says, there's the reason that we call, that we have these terms totemism and animism are in part because of some strange, strange history of, of anthropological terminology. Uh, the idea of, of calling, it, it has something to do with what totem poles were called, but then trans, got transmitted on, onto, onto Australia for various reasons is on page 112. Internal to the history of social anthropology, the classical place for such systems subsequently shifted from North America to Australia. So again, we're not exactly sure how that happened, but totemism is basically going to be what we talk, he groups for the Australian, context versus animism for the circumpolar north. So in totemism, the land and the what the ancestors were able to, to congeal into the land during this time of the dreaming is the creative source of, of everything that's, that's amazing in the world. And on page 114, Gold sums it up in one perhaps confusing sentence or two, two brief sentence, the totemic world is essential, um, that people are sharing in the substance of the animals, which also share in the substance of the land. Um, and it is in taking care of the land and in moving about the land that you do your stuff. Whereas the, in animism, the, the, central idea is that of a circulating vital force. As we talked about, uh, this is on page 112, life. Well, maybe that's, maybe it's, maybe it's best to read this paragraph. At the most fundamental level, the contrast is about the relative priority of form and process. With a totemic ontology, the forms life takes are already given congealed in perpetuity in the features, textures, and contours of the land. 
and it is the land that harbors the vital forces which animate the plants, animals, and people it engenders. With an animic ontology to the contrary, life is itself generative of form. Vital force, far from being petrified in the solid medium, is free-flowing like the wind, and it is on its uninterrupted circulation that the continuity of the living world depends. And so he says that the totemic world is essential. The animic anon animism, the world of animism is dialogical, circulating in a kind of dialogue between the humans, we'll deal with, and non-human animals that make it up. So there's a, a central or distinguishing feature of both of the thought or the ontology thoughts about being, which comes out in the depictions of animals starts on pages 115 through uh, um, basically 115 through 117, where you have these paintings, especially in totemism, it tends to be more paintings. And uh, some very interesting features of this kangaroo with a human-like spirit. And Ingold says, you know, that the, this human anthropomorphized spirit is moving and doing all this activity, but the kangaroo is, is, uh, is in some cases you can see the organs of the kangaroo. In other cases, you can see that it's kind of like it's already cut up or it looks like a map on the land. It's, it's basically inert part of the land um, and is expressed mostly in painting. Interestingly too, um, in Australia, there is uh, also a tradition of, of painting the body. I think this is uh, on page 128, uh, especially in preparation for dances and ceremonies, um, they would, uh, paint the body and Ingold compares that to the use of, of masks in, uh, in the circumpolar north. In animism, things are um, often more along the lines of carving. And so these carved little emblems and icons, um, the, the animals themselves are much more active. And again, interestingly, and as we in some ways discussed in, in the last chapter, uh, they would dress in the skins of animals. And Ingold says, of course, yes, you need to keep warm, but there's more to it than that, that by doing that, you take upon the properties or the capacities of the animals. Whereas in Australia, there is hardly ever the dressing in the skins of animals. And in animism, there's not so much painting of bodies, but the painting of, of masks, which are parallel in some ways to the taking upon the, the characteristics of that. Uh, when, you, when you peer through the mask, it, it becomes another, another face. Again, we talked about this in the, in the last class that you would take upon the body, the clothing is the body, and the clothing furnishes you with those capacities. Um, and so there's there's quite, I think, interesting contrast here. And I was trying to find some, some different images from uh, Australia and the Circumpolar North. I found one that was for sale or sold in an art gallery by the, um, by the, uh, the same painter, Namareggi Gaimala. Um, again, the, uh, 
is close to the one we see here with the spirits and the spirits are being active, but there's that cross hatching, a very, again, passive or inert, perhaps already, already dead kangaroo, um, which seems to represent a, a landscape or a map of the land um, and more than anything. Whereas we have here, and I couldn't, I couldn't find another uh, drawing. These seem to be from a personal collection by David Luc Alasuek, uh, who is, I, I think, a famous st storyteller and artist in the Inuit uh, world. Uh, this one is, <laughs> is, I think Gold says, I'm, I'm killing a hoodless caribou, which Again, goes back to some, or if we look on page 117, this hunter who is thinking of, sh of firing off an arrow, but is met or is contemplating whether or not uh, he should do that. Um, because in some ways here, um, this, is, this is not a good moment. The caribou has, has not given itself to the hunter and, and has in fact revealed itself to be, uh, to be something, in, something not, this is not a friendly encounter. And in fact, even though the hunter has, has killed the caribou, ah, there it is, it's on page 122. So, you know, to kill without the animal's active connivance would be an act of violence, carrying the threat of equally violent retribution in the future. How then can a hunter know for sure whether an animal means to give itself up or not? So this is a dilemma. It says here, another picture. The arrow has already penetrated the body of the caribou whose forelegs are giving way in a posture that vividly portrays its imminent death. But look at the faces of the hunter and his prey. The man stares at us with an expression of wide-eyed terror. The gentle caribou has turned into a frightening predator and we're left wondering who in fact is hunting whom. So a very different representation of what is going on in the hunting process. In the Australian depictions, the animal is often depicted as already dead, as cut up as, as as being part of the land itself. Whereas in the circumpolar north, as we've seen in other examples, this is a, a constant circulation of life force, which can in some cases be uh, go, go back upon the hunter. And it's quite strikingly, um, in the in the according to the, the ethnographers of the Australian situation, for the people in Australia there, they called it a, a mundane activity. The actual pursuit of animals lacks cosmological significance. Just need to get food to survive because it is actually the land that is providing. And it, the hunting is a way of moving about on the land. And interestingly, which probably uh, would make sense uh, in contrast to all the ornamentation of weapons and, and, and kind of the art forms that we see uh, among, um, in the circumpolar north, there's hardly any, uh, the ornament, ornamentation of equipment is conspicuously absent. So they, you know, it's, it's as if it, I don't wanna say it's not a big deal, but it's more, it's more a simple provisioning and the important part is living with and on the land, uh, not the hunting process itself. Whereas in animism, it is the hunt that is the sort of that has a kind of cosmological significance and is a form of regeneration. It's not the land that's providing as much as it is as it is the animals that are providing. And as we've just been talking about, there's a, a dialogue or a, a, um, a conversation, a, con 
uh, that, and the animal is supposed to consent to be or give itself up to be uh, to, to be killed and thus regenerate the life spirit and the life process goes on. So some really interesting contrast between the, um, the sort of ontology of the Australian uh, systems and the ontology of the uh, circumpolar north here, which come out uh, in everyday activities and in the depiction of animals. I don't think there's any other details of this which would help us. Willa, does that help at all? A little bit here and there. I mean, there's some things about metaphor and metonym in there that, huh? Yeah, it's, it's again, tough going. I think, I think if you kind of, you know, if you, there's, there's the major contrast between them. And if you then things, there's sort of variations within or different ways of, of solving the issues within each, uh, within each society. Um, so like I said, really uh, interesting material. As I was going through this, I, I wanted to revisit something that I talked about in the last class, which was the idea of the, you know, when we talk about ontology as the way of being. And in the last class, I said, well, maybe we need to take seriously the ontology of, say, the Ojibwa as potentially solving the solving a, a, an issue or a problem that, that we have with human potential. Um, and in this chapter, of course, Ingold is himself pluralizing ontologies. He's comparing two very different ontologies from two different parts of the world, which made me wonder again about this, uh, the ontological turn in, in Wikipedia, which I argued that at the end, of this when it says it's not a difference in worldviews, but differences in worlds and all of these worlds are of equal validity. Um, and in the last class I said that, um, that this was one place where I thought I agreed more with Ingold in terms of that we live in, as Ingold has put it, we do share one world of manifest difference. And to just say that people live in completely different worlds of equal validity is pretty close to a, I guess I would say a sealed off cultural relativism approach. But certainly in this chapter, it does seem that, how to say these, if, if we're going to grant that they are very different ontologies and very different both very different ontologies from our own, to what extent then are they describing the really real of the world or the being that is there? And this point is, I guess it's kind of perplexing for me, but I, I think that I'm going to try to preliminarily solve it <laughs> by saying that I think that sometimes, at least me or others, might get, I think that we in the West think that we can cut away the philosophy part or the ideas about reality from the actual engagement in reality. So we can take science and apply it anywhere. And I think that when we, when we talk about other, the ontology, of other peoples. And if we're not, if it's not simply a cultural construction imposed upon a, a reality which we can only truly know by Western science, we would also say that those ideas, be it Ojibwa or in the circumpolar north or in different parts of Australia, you can't just cut those ideas away and and sort of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become an an Ojibwa ontologist in my, when I'm going home from school, in the sense that they can't be separated from living in a place and from a tradition of, of people who are actively thinking and talking through them and the specific plants and animals that 
make that place up. I think that maybe it's difficult to dress up as a kangaroo and dressing up as a bear is uh, it's a different climate and a different uh, environment. And it might be, might be nicer to have a bear skin on, whereas living in a kangaroo skin in Australia is probably not the best idea. So there's different features of the landscape, different people, plants, and animals, which in some ways our ontology, our ontology can gr grows out of our engagement in the real world. Now, I think that one of the interesting things about an ontology of say Western science and even some ideas in other societies is that the ideas can migrate or travel or be applied in different places as do people, as do plants and animals. And sometimes they come together, you know, when the Europeans show up with their own plants, animals and ideas and start imposing them on places like Australia, they came as a package, but sometimes they travel in different ways and independently of each other and intermingle and do different things. So I think that, again, going back, I think that we do have to insist that we live in one world and we only have one and we all share it, which is potentially constantly proliferating difference in the process of life. But is there one, is there one ontology or one way of being in the world? I guess not, but we can draw upon uh, these other poetics for ways to do science. So back to the big point. And I think maybe, hopefully, maybe, I don't know. This makes a little bit more sense now. Um, so Ingold has said that we, the idea that art is a capacity of humanity needs to be rethought. So he's saying that what they share, even though they're very different, the paintings, the carvings, the different ways of being in the world, what they, sh what they do both share is that, is that their way of depicting is not that of pulling yourself out of the world, but to try and reveal it it is not it is not representational. And so at the end, he says that if we're trying to understand what people of the past were doing with those cave paintings or uh, the history of art that Gabe's going to study once all those languages get get into view. Uh, that we must cease thinking of painting and carving as modalities of the production of art. So there's this idea that there's this, again, this capacity for art and some people paint and some people carve and some people dance, but it's all part of a human capacity for art and view art instead as one rather particular and historically very specific ob objectification of the activities of painting and carving. Huh? What are the activities? Huh? The activities are skills. Are skills that we develop. Yeah, I've been thinking about that question a lot since you asked it. We are right to admire the skills of Australian Aboriginal painters and of Inuit and Yupik carvers. So what they have are they are developing their skills like all skills, they are acquired through practice and training within an environment. So, and some of them are now being sold as art, but Ingold would say that's a very recent thing that they're selling, they're able to sell them as art or, or actually pre use, use them and get, get money for them. That would be a new thing. They are skills. And then, yeah, they are not, however, culturally specific dialects of a naturally evolved and developmentally pre-constituted capacity for art. 
exists as such a capacity as a figment of the Western imagination. 